Hi, and welcome back to Psychology with me, Mr. Snyder, and today we are going to be continuing our discussion of the biological perspective by talking about the brain itself. So our learning, uh, learning targets today are going to be talking about how we study the brain and nervous system, the functions and the parts and structures of the brain, uh, how lateralization differences um, which side of the hemisphere controls which uh, side of the body, and describe various issues in neuroscience and genetics. So basically we have a couple different ways of studying the brain. Let's talk about some of these. Uh, lesioning, brain stimulation, and neuroimaging techniques. So lesioning, uh, we'll talk about here, we anesthetize the animals. We then purposefully damage parts of the animal's brain through an electrical current and then test to see what happens to its abilities. It, you know, we like to, don't like to do it, but it is, does give us a lot of information about what parts of the brain control which parts of the behavior of people and animals. There's uh, invasive and non-invasive brain uh, stimulation techniques. Deep brain stimulation Basically, we take electrodes and we place them in specific deep brain areas, and then electrode wires are impulsed or routed to an impulse generator, which then sends impulses to the specific brain areas of interest. And that's how we can tell which parts of the brain do which, and we can make the brain uh, feel certain things and hear see certain things. Um, it, it's really quite interesting. Non-invasive techniques, we can, uh, there's something rather new called transcranial magnetic stimulation and they take these huge paddles and basically shoot very strong magnetic pulses uh, through the cortex uh, using special copper wires that are positioned over the head. So this is outside the brain, it's non-invasive. Uh, there are different ways of mapping the brain, and we can do a CT scan or a computed tomography scan, which is a uh, series of x-rays using a computer. It can show stroke damage, tumors, injuries, uh, head trauma, and abnormal brain structure. There's also an MRI, uh, bleh, excuse me, an MRI, which is more detailed than a CT, and it shows, can show the effects of very small strokes. There is an EEG or an electroencephalogram, which electrodes are placed on the head using these small metal discs and um, basically routed to a computer so we can view the electrical activity of the brain. It can tell us the stages of sleep, seizures, tumors, active brain areas during mental tasks. If you're doing a puzzle, part of your brain is going to be active rather than if you were sleeping. So that this can help us study the brain as well. There's also a PET scan or a positron emission tomography scan, which we inject radioactive glucose, uh, glucose into the subject and then the com computer can pick up that radioactivity in the brain cells that consume the glucose and uh, uh, we end up with a color-coded picture where lighter, cutter, lighter colors on the picture indicate greater activity. And then there's an fMRI which is kind of a video, you know, it, it tracks changes in the oxygen levels of the blood. They are identified by putting the scan over the picture of the brain structure. So it's not, it's kind of like a video, but not quite, but it's a functional MRI. Here you can see a CT scan. Uh, on the left is a five-year-old girl with a head injury, and on the right is normal, so we can see a little bit of brain swelling there. Uh, an EEG record just gives you electrical pulses going on, a PET scan image, and an fMRI image there. Now let's go into the structure of the brain. The structure of the brain, basically there's three main divisions, the forebrain, the midbrain, and the hindbrain. The hindbrain is at the base of your skull. It was the first to develop. It contains the medulla, the pons, the reticular formation, and the cerebellum. Uh, the midbrain is involved in the sensory and motor functions and relaying those up to other areas of the brain. And the forebrain contains your cor cerebral cortex, your basal ganglia, and your limbic system. So let's go ahead and discuss these. 
Uh, here is a picture. You may want to screenshot this or kind of write this down uh, about different parts of the brain. So I'll let you do that here for a second. Uh, the hindbrain, the medulla, is the large swelling at the top of the spinal cord. It's the lowest part of the brain. You got to know where it's at and what it does. This is life-sustaining functions like heart rate, breathing, and swallowing. The pons is also uh, life important to life because it plays a large part in sleep, dreaming, and left-right body coordination and arousal. So it's the larger swelling above the medulla that connects the lower sections to, of the brain to the upper sections of the brain. Here you can see the medulla right here, and the pons is a little bit above that. I'll keep going back to that part. Also in the hindbrain is the reticular formation, which is responsible for attention. So if you are... Um, driving down the road and nothing's going on and then obvious uh, all of a sudden a car pulls out in front of you your reticular formation is going to kick into effect and you're going to notice that car and then kind of swerve out of the way for action it, it stimulates the upper part of the brain keeps people awake and alert and uh, is responsible for selective attention what do we pay attention to and then the cerebellum is the little brain and it's located on the lower part of the brain behind the pons, and it's called little brain because it looks like a little brain. It basically is involved in coordination, fine motor movements, voluntary movements that have to happen in rapid succession. Go ahead and take a look at this. The cerebellum is right here. And then your reticular formation is running up through the middle here. just so you can see where those are at. The limbic system as a part of the forebrain is our, it's a whole bunch of structures kind of in a circle. It's involved in learning, emotion, and motivation. And it includes the thalamus, the hypothalamus, the hippocampus, the amygdala, and the cingulate cortex. So let's go ahead and take a look at those. The thalamus is in the middle. And its job is kind of a relay station. Think of a bunch of trains going into a train depot, getting all turned around and then sent out into different places. It relays sensory information to the proper areas of the forebrain or the cortex. So it sends, sends all the sensory information coming in to the appropriate parts of the brain. Uh, if you damage the thalamus, it may result in the loss of sensations. Um, the hypothalamus means under the thalamus. It's very small, but it's very powerful. It's located below the thalamus and directly above the pituitary gland. It's responsible for so many things like sleep, hunger, thirst, sex, aggression, and it also regulates a person's homeostasis. The hippocampus, it means seahorse because it's shaped like a seahorse. It is a curved structure uh, within each temporal lobe, and we'll talk about that in a second. And it's responsible for long-term memories. And the amygdala is shaped like an almond, so it is named the amygdala, which means almond. It's uh, responsible for your fear responses and the me uh, memory of fear. And information from the senses goes to the amygdala before the upper part of the brain, which helps stimulate a quicker response to danger. Are these on this picture? Thalamus and hypothalamus are. Thalamus is here in the middle. Hypothalamus is right underneath, very small. Let's keep going up. Here you go, your thalamus, hypothalamus right underneath it. The amygdala is this little almond-shaped thing. Cingulate cortex we'll get to. Hippocampus is down below. The outermost brain, uh, part of the brain, the thing that you see when you think of a brain, is known as the cerebral cortex. It's one-tenth of an inch thick on average, but it's wrinkled together to allow for more surface area. It packs more neurons in. And basically what the cortex is responsible for is, divide, is um, higher thought processes, thinking, reasoning, scheduling. 
and it also interprets the sensory inputs sent by the thalamus. So let's take a look at the uh, part of the cerebral hemispheres. Your brain is divided in half, pretty much, and the only thing that connects it is the corpus callosum, which is neural fibers. It's ba basically a lot of axons running back and forth across the brain, and it connects the right and left hemispheres. And your brain takes advantage of contralateral organization. So if I'm waving my right hand, that is controlled by my left brain. So each hemisphere is responsible for the opposite side of the body, basically for uh, most things. It plays a role in information coming from many of the sense organs in the brain and the motor commands going to the rest of the body. And each of these hemispheres on the cortex can be divided into four lobes, your occipital, parietal, temporal, and frontal. And let's go ahead and uh, take care of these. Here's where they are, frontals in the front. Uh, your parietal is basically toward the back of the head. Occipital is the back of the head. And the temporal lobe is near your ears, basically where your temple is, if you can remember that on your head. The occipital lobe is located at the rear and bottom in the back of your head. It controls your vision. It has your primary visual cortex and your visual association cortex, but just know that it is in charge of vision, which is why when you get hit in the back of the head, sometimes you can see stars if that part of the area, if that part of the brain is damaged, even temporarily. Your parietal lobe is at the top and the back of each cerebral hemisphere. Uh, it comprises the somatosensory cortex. And just think of that word sensory because it is what receives information from the bottom of your body. And it processes that sensory information for touch, temperature, body position, etc. The somatosensory cortex is uh, responsible for your senses. Just remember that. Your temporal lobe is uh, just behind the temples right here. It is the, responsible for the hearing and meaningful speech. And it has your primary auditory cortex, your auditory association area, and an area involved in language is in the left temporal lobe, we do know. And then your frontal lobe is up here. That it takes care of planning, personality, memory. All of the higher order thinking takes place in your frontal lobe. And it comprises of the prefrontal cortex. And then right next to the sensory cortex, or somatosensory cortex, is your motor cortex, which controls the body's voluntary movements. And it also comprises of mirror neurons that are firing when an animal performs an action that makes you want to perform that same action. So here, I love this picture, by the way. It kind of shows exactly what those motor cortexes and somatosensory cortexes are responsible for. And see here, we're looking at the left side of the brain. So these things would be controlling your right fingers, your right thumb, or it would be receiving uh, somatic, it would, sensory information from your right fingers or your right thumb. So the association areas within the cortex are responsible for the interpretation of information that's coming in. So instead of just seeing four lines and a window with a handle, we know that's a door and that we can walk through it. And it helps us interpret information coming in through our, our uh, sensory information. So Broca's area is one area of, or it's one association area in the cortex. And it's it present in the left frontal lobe of most people, um, most right-handed people, that is. And it allows smooth and fluent speech. However, if you get damage to Broca's area, which is called Broca's aphasia, uh, it causes broken speech. So I can understand speech just fine if I have Broca's aphasia, but I can't speak. And I'll halt with mispronounced words, kind of like I'm doing right now. Wernicke's area is in the left temporal lobe, and it's involved in hearing and understanding words. And if you get Wernicke's aphasia, damage to this leads to a condition where the affected person can speak fluently, but yet they cannot understand um, what's going on. 
Spatial neglect is a condition that happens when there is damage to the right parietal and occipital lobe, and it means that I won't be able to see objects in my left visual field. And I'll get a figure up here in a little bit to show you what that means, but I can't see objects to my left. And this was realized, and we'll watch something about this in class, but a psychologist named Roger Speary cut through a patient's corpus callosum, basically creating two half brains. And it cured this patient's epilepsy, but we were also able to use this as a case study and use special testing uh, and send messages to only one side of the brain in patients with a split brain. It's really, really interesting, and it allowed us to pinpoint exactly what each side of the brain does. So the results from these experiments are we know that the left hemisphere is more specialized in language, handwriting, speech, math, uh, time and rhythm and thought analysis. So if you hear someone say they're left brained, it means they have more specialization in those areas. Right hemisphere is more specialized in uh, creative activities. So perception, visualization, spatial perception, the patterns, faces, emotions, melodies, music, art, emotions. This is all done in the right hemisphere. And it, it's kind of gotten blown out of proportion in uh, popular culture because you're using both hemispheres of your brain all the time. It's just that these sides specialize in somewhat different areas, as said right here. Here's another table of which side of the hemispheres each is controlled. And here's the split brain experiment where you can see the different visual fields. So it's not just controlling or closing your left eye and not being able to see stuff. It's different, you know, you have different visual fields available. And we've been doing experiments in, to use this in ADHD, or Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, which is recognized by the DSM-5. And it involves behavioral and cognitive aspects of inattention, uh, impulsive behavior, behavior, and hyperactivity. Uh, it also has biological, cognitive, and behavioral markers, which means that all of those can um, basically make up the disease and any or the disorder in any one person. Uh, we focus on cognitive attention problems or the lack of vigilance or a lack of control of one's own cognitive processes and ADHD is currently being researched with environmental, biological, genetic, and personality factors in mind. That is all I have for you today. Go ahead and fill out those learning targets and I will see you back in class. Bye-bye.